I would say to people that out of, I think it's about 300 songs that John and I wrote together, we never had a dry session. We'd always come in and we never went away from the session going, ah, couldn't get it today. We always finished a song, which is pretty remarkable. I Lost My Little Girl. It's the first song I wrote. That was very simple, three chords, four chords. And um, yeah, it was real early, little kind of rock and roll thing. I got a guitar when I was um, early teens and I learned a couple of chords. I learned a G and a G7, C and an F. And using those chords, I made up this little song called I Lost My Little Girl. People asked me whether it was about losing my mother at that early age, which I don't know. Psych psychiatrists might uh, have a field day with that, but um, I certainly didn't think it was at the time, but it could have been. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far. I woke up and I had the melody to a song yesterday in my brain. And I didn't have any words, so I called it scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love you. I think the difference between me and a lot of people is they, they often dream about music, but they don't remember it. Uh, but for some reason, this melody just uh, kept going around and around my brain. So I was near a piano, so I, I kind of remembered it and blocked out some chords. A couple of months later, I put some uh, words to it. Yesterday. One, two, three. When John and I, John Lennon and I were getting together, we were kind of showing each other what we'd written and, and this was one I, I said to him, well, I got this idea and I started off with it and uh, we finished it together. So it was a very early Lennon McCartney song. Having a collaborator, one thing's great, if you get stuck with, th with something, you can just say, what do you think of this? You know, and you can kick it around together. My song started, um, she was just 17. She'd never been a beauty queen. And we kind of looked at each other, like, I said, I don't really like that line. So we changed it to, she's just 17, you know what I mean. Which makes more sense even though you probably don't know what I mean. So we changed it to that, and they, that uh, started our songwriting partnership. Most of it was start from scratch, but sometimes one of us would just have an idea, like of the first couple of lines, and then we'd just sit down and work it. But a lot of it, we just came in and just started talking about what we might want to write about, and, and then we'd just sit down. It were pretty quick sessions. It was normally like about three hours, and we'd finish something, um, you know, from beginning to end with the chords and the melody and the words. You've written 300 songs. Do you ever forget a lot of the songs that you've written? And you hear them and you're yeah. Them. I mean, 300 was just the ones I wrote with John. Since then, I've written lots more. And you do forget them, yeah. And that is my excuse. And if you saw my love... And I love her. I brought it. I'd written it, and I brought it into the studio, and I was showing the guys. George Martin, our producer, said, it'd be nice to have an intro on it. You know, like to have a little something leading the song in. So we were sitting around thinking, and George Harrison just went, what about this? Do, 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 do. And I think, you know, that song wouldn't be anything without that. We just came up with it. So uh, that was the kind of pace we worked at. Because nobody ever knew what song we were about to record. And it'd be me, me and John would know, because we were written it the previous week. But George and Ringo and the producer wouldn't know what we were. So we'd say, oh, it goes like this, you know, and we'd show them. And in the space of about 20 minutes, they'd go, OK. And then we'd just record it. So it was a very fast process. And uh, that was a very cool, cool move. You know, he just made up that riff. And I say, if you think about the song, without that riff, it wouldn't be half as good. Hello, Rigby was um, 
When I was when I was really little, um, I lived on w what we call a housing estate, uh, which is like the project. There were a lot of old ladies, and I enjoyed sitting around with these older ladies because they they had these great stories. In in this case, about World War Two, you know, and one in particular who I used to kind of just visit and I'd kind of go shopping for her, you know, she couldn't get out. So anyway, so I remember her. So I had that figure in my mind of a sort of lonely old lady. And over the years, I'd met a couple of others. And I don't know, maybe the loneliness made me sort of empathize with them. But I, I, I thought it was a great character. So I, I started this song about a lonely old lady who picks up the rice in the church, who never really uh, gets the dreams in her life. And uh, then I added in the, the priest, the vicar, Father Mackenzie. And so there was just the two characters, you know. So it was nice, it was like writing a, a short story. And, but it was based basically on these old ladies that I had known as, as a kid. Father Mackenzie in the song, I originally had Father McCartney, but when I came to finish it up with John, I brought it to John and we were playing it around. And I said, uh, I don't, want to, I don't want to call this Father McCartney because it's like my dad. It just is a bit confusing. And he said, no, it's fine, it's fine. I said, no, I don't like it. So I said, okay, let's change it. So we got the phone book. And we just went right down to sort of McCartney, 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 and looked for something, Mc something. And the next one was like Mackenzie. I said, that's better. So he became Father Mackenzie. Sometimes I do that, you know, just to block it out. So as you, so you don't spend forever trying to figure out the exact lyric. You just go ba da 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 da. So it could be Barbara Hawkins, Miss Daisy, and you you just leave it for like that, and then you go, I don't really like that. So I was looking around for another name. This is a kind of strange story about that because I, I wanted, I like the name Eleanor. We've been working with an actress called Eleanor Braun, in uh, the Beatles film Help. So I like the name Eleanor. But I was looking for this Eleanor Papa to make the, the rhythm. So I was looking for this nice surname and uh, I happened to be in Bristol and the, I saw a shop that said Rigby. So I thought, oh great, Eleanor Rigby. So now I had the, the name of my main character. But then years later, somebody else is researching this and they said, you know in that village where you used to, where John used to live, um, there's a graveyard uh, in the church, and there is a gravestone there to an Eleanor Rigby. So I said, did I subconsciously know that name? Why would I go around searching for it? I don't know. I think it's maybe a coincidence, but there is a gravestone in Liverpool in, in a place called Woolton where me and John met that does say Eleanor Rigby. Do -de -do -de -do -de -do -de -de Day in the Life was um, a song that John had started and uh, he kind of had the first verse. And this often happened. One of us would have a little bit of an idea and instead of sitting down and sweating it, we'd just bring it to the other one and kind of finish it together because you could ping pong. You know, you get an idea and he'd get an idea and he would say, oh, that's good. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, say he had the first verse. I read the news today, oh boy. And we sat in my music room in London and just started playing around with it, got a second verse. And then we got to the, what was gonna lead into the middle. And we kind of looked at each other and kind of knew we were being a little bit kind of edgy. And we sort of said, I'd love to turn you on. So we kind of knew like, it, this would have an effect. It worked. And then we put another section I had, woke up, fell out of bed, tried to comb across my head. So I had that section, so we put that in. And then finished the song up, and then did a big sort of epic recording of it with a big full orchestra and everything, you know. And then did that crescendo thing in the middle of it with the orchestra. 
which was an idea I'd had because I'd been I'd been talking to people and reading about sort of avant-garde music, kind of atonal stuff, crazy ideas. And I came up with this idea. I said to the orchestra, "You should start, all of you." Which they're all looking at me puzzled. We've got a real symphony orchestra in London who are used to playing, you know, Beethoven. And here's me, so this crazy guy out of a group. And I'm saying, all you got to do is you, or everyone, start on the lowest note that your instrument can play, and work your way up to the highest at your own pace. Just if you want to go, that's fine. Or you know, that was too puzzling for them, and they're all looking at me. And orchestras don't like that kind of thing. They like it written down, and they like to know exactly what they're supposed to do. So George Martin, the producer, th realized that. He kept the random aspect, but he said to the people, you should be about this note at this point in the song, and then you should have got to this note and this note. And he left the random thing. So that's why it sounds like a chaotic, chaotic sort of swirl, you know. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was an idea based on the sort of avant-garde stuff that I was into at the time. Hey Jude, don't make it back. John and his wife Cynthia had divorced and I felt a bit sorry for their son who was now a little bit, you know, a child of a divorce. I was driving out to see the son and uh, Cynthia one day and I was, I was thinking about the boy whose name is Julian, Julian then. And I started this idea, hey Jules, don't make it bad, so it's going to be okay. You know, it was like a reassurance song. So that was the idea that I got driving out to see them. I saw them and then I came back and uh, worked on the song some more. But I liked the name Jude. I didn't realize it meant Jewish, which it does. Actually, I nearly got into trouble because we, we put it up on, on a window of our shop, we had a little, we had a little shop, because we were into fashion, would you believe, for a while. On the f shop window we put, hey Jude, so that people going by on the buses would see, what's that, you know, intriguing, ah, and then it was our record. Well, I got this furious phone call from this guy, Mr. Leon, who was Jewish, and he said, what are you doing, how dare you do this, and so, so hey Jude, because in Hitler's day, in the Nazi thing, Juden Raus meant Jews out. So, and I didn't connect. It's, I actually heard the name first in, a, in one of the musicals, but I like the name. Anyway, he rings me up and he's furious. Why are you doing this, you know, making fun of the Jews? We've got enough. Blah, 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 blah. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. I swear to you, it's nothing like that. He said, I'm going to send my son around to beat you up. I said, hey, baby, let's cool it down. Nothing to do with that. I said, you'll hear when you hear the record. It's just a name in a song, and it's all cool. But, of course, I, you know, I suddenly was alerted to the fact that it would have caused him a lot of problems because his family will have experienced that, you know, um, firsthand probably. Anyway, I calmed him down, and he was cool. And his son didn't come around to beat me up. <laughs> Whenever I do a new tour, I think, well, I'll just switch up all the songs. But then I go, I've got to do Hey Jude, because it is such fun. Um, and it's great handing that over to the audience, you know. And you know what the greatest thing is? You feel this sense of community. And in these times when it's a little dark and it's, people are sort of separated by politics and stuff, it's so fantastic to see them all come together singing the end of Hey Jude. So I'm very happy about that, so I keep it in the show. Helter Skelter, yeah, I heard it on the car radio the other day. I did think, wow, you know, it is. I could see why people would think it was the precursor of heavy metal. How it came about was I had read in a, a music paper that The Who had, had done a really heavy track and um, Pete Townsend of The Who was quoted saying, it, this is the, we've just made the dirtiest, loudest, filthiest song ever. So I was kind of jealous. I didn't hear their song. I still don't know what song he was referring to, but I went in the studio and said, guys, 
we've got to do a song that's dirtier and filthier and louder than The Who. The thing about the Beatles stuff was that um, when I look back on the, our, what we produced, there's no two songs that are alike. Whereas, you know, a lot of record artists will find a great formula and they, the next three singles are kind of the same song, you know. Um, but we just, we were young guys and we would have got bored doing that. And the, the, the worst thing ever, seeing as we're allowed in the studio, allowed to play guitars and things, the worst thing ever would have been just to sit around bored. So we, we, we always changed whatever we were about to do and did something different. So I had this Helter Skelter thing and we did that. And uh, yeah, it is pretty raw, you know, it's pretty screamy. But it was good to do. We did a lot of takes on it, so it was hard on Ringo. You know, on one of the on one of the takes, he, you can hear him right at the end. He says, "I got blisters on my fingers." So he'd been drumming so hard and so loud, you know. That, uh, but yeah, I, I wonder whether, you know, heavy metal bands heard that and thought that's the way to go. They're like you know, loud rock and roll, basically. And I know the ACDC guys, and they're loud. Have you seen them live? Oh, baby. That's, that's one of the joys being in a band, is you get to plug in an electric guitar and turn it up just as loud as you want. And it's such a sort of cool feeling that uh, I could see why you'd form a group based around that idea. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Blackbird, I was sitting around with my acoustic guitar and I'd heard about the civil rights troubles that were happening in, in the 60s in Alabama, Mississippi, Little Rock in particular. So that was in my mind and I just thought it'd be really good if I could write something that if it ever reached any of the people going through those problems, it might kind of give them a little bit of hope. So uh, I wrote Blackbird and in England, a Bird, is a girl, so I was thinking of a black girl going through this, you know, you, now's your time to arise, you, you know, set yourself free and uh, take these broken wings. One of the nice things about music is that you know that a lot of people listening to you are going to take seriously what you're saying in the song so I, I'm very proud of the fact that the Beatles' output um, is always really pretty positive. And there's hardly anything in there that sort of says, go and screw your parents or whatever. You know, it's always pretty, let it be, hey Jude, Blackbird. So it's hopefully a good message. I particularly like that. And you, sometimes when I'm writing songs, um, I will think there's people out there who are going through some problems, and hopefully um, people out there will listen to it and think, oh yeah, it's not just me alone going through this, you know, this is something, and also something I can fix. Let it be, let it be. Let yeah, it be. That was a, another dream song, actually. I'd been overdoing it, you know, it was the 60s, and we were just getting crazed and stuff a lot of the time. And so I went to bed and, um, wasn't feeling too great inside my, in my in myself, and in the dream, my mother came in to me in the dream, and she died, um, maybe ten years previously, and so when someone who you've lost comes back to you in a dream, it's a miraculous moment, you know, because you you're with them, and you your mind doesn't say, wait a minute, you shouldn't be here, you're just with them, and so it was really nice, you know, because there's my mom, and oh my. You know, very emotional. And she seemed to realize, this is all going on in my mind, of course, but you know, forget that. She seemed to realize that I was going through struggles. And she said, it's gonna be okay. It's all really gonna be okay. And she said, just, just let it be. And I went, ah, and felt great. And woke up and thought, what was that, what? And I remembered the dream, I thought, what did she say? Let it be, and then I sat down at the piano and wrote the song. It had a lot of emotion because of who'd said it and my situation. So that kind of translated to the record. And I think that's why a lot of people like it. They, they feel 
somehow that kind of magic comes through. Why, why the piano, why not a guitar? Um, I don't know. You know, just sometimes you just sit down at a piano and sometimes there isn't a piano, so you play the guitar. It's not like a formula, it's just what you fancy at the time. And that particular song, there was a piano in my room, so I just sort of wrote it on the piano. Um, and it, it still is a piano song when I do it live. It's a piano song. Those times after the 60s were pretty high. And, you know, a lot of people were getting high. So to me, it's just like a fantasy song, sort of say, hey girl, come on, let's get high. And now I must admit, it can get a little bit embarrassing because I've got grandkids. And here's me going, yeah, is everybody get high. So when we do it in live, I kind of go, let's get high on life. <laughs> a little bit of a disclaimer there, you know. But um, at the time, it was just about the times and uh, multicolored band. And it's, a, it's very much a period piece, but it, it goes down well. And one of my guys sort of rang me up and said, hey, you know, this, we've got a problem. What? Oh, the BBC have just banned Higher High, they won't play it. Why not? Well, it's drug related and uh, they're pretty straight laced, you know. One of my two banned records. I, you know, I can see why. And if I said, I really After John died, there'd been a lot of talk about who did what and who liked who and did the Beatles argue and no, no, no. I was almost buying into this idea that um, me and John were sort of fighting all the time. But I, I just remembered it wasn't true. So I wrote this song about, you know, if you were here, you might say this or that. Or so. But I know better. I, know, I remember well some of the things we did. It was, really, it was really, for me, thinking about John and just thinking, you know what, we, we had a great relationship. And like any family, there's always arguments, there's always disputes, but in the end, you know, we loved each other. And um, I wanted to do, I wanted to make a song where I actually said, I love you to John. And so that was that song. Again, it's quite emotional, you know, because it came from a real feeling about him. And uh, wanting to correct the record, kind of in my mind, as much as in anyone else's mind. And there are some photos from that period which are really beautiful. And there's just him and me working, and you can see we loved each other. So, but you know, once, once all these rumors go about, you almost buy into them yourself. Anyway, so I, that song kind of helped me set the record straight. I was in a songwriting mood, and it was up in Scotland, I just thought, okay, I've just got to go somewhere and try and write a song. And we happened to have a little pony that was called Jet on the farm. I was on a farm in Scotland. And uh, I actually took my guitar and hiked up this great big hill. I just kind of find myself a place which is in the middle of nature and um, just sat there and just started making up a song, you know. It's not one of those songs that I, even when I sing it now, I don't kind of know what, where all the words came from. I know where Jet came from, and I, I like the name. The words are I can't, probably about me and my father-in-law, you know, early days of getting married, and when your father-in-law is kind of a nuisance, and you kind of, hey, so he's probably the major in it. But, uh, you know, it's only a song, so you kind of work you work your things out. That one was written halfway up a mountain in Scotland. Then record, recorded in Nigeria, yeah. I was wondering where to record and I fancied getting out of England. So I asked my record label, which is EMI, to supply me with a list of all the studios they had around the world. I knew they had a lot. And one was in China, one was in Rio de Janeiro, and one was in Lagos. Nigeria. So I went, yeah, Lagos, come on. Because I, I like African music a lot. I love, love the rhythms of African music. 
And um, so I chose that, not realizing that it would be a really basic little studio. And we kind of built half the studio. They didn't have a vocal booth. You, know, you go in a booth to isolate your voice. They didn't have one. So we had to explain to them, you take some wood and you do this and you get some glass and you put it in like that. So we, we built the uh, vocal booths. But it was kind of nice. I liked the primitive aspect of it. And being in Africa was pretty interesting experience. If you've got three hours, I'll tell you about it. I Don't Know is um, the one that opens the album and it's much more uh, angst-ridden. But again, you know, you, you sit down to write a song and you think, oh, I'm not going to write anything that's like too sad or desperate. People are going to think I'm desperate. But, but you go, no, people like that. I like that. So I'm going to write something. You can often take a moment you remember where you had, like, let's say, an argument, and you think, you think of that situation, and you work it out in the song. So just by saying the opening lines, I've got crows at my window, dogs at my door, I don't think I can take any more, that makes you feel better. And you suddenly, oh, it's a song. And you, you're crafting it into a vehicle that kind of puts all those thoughts in there, all, all your kind of troubles and woes. So you kind of work, you work your things out in songs. One of the great things about writing songs it's almost like a therapy. You can go in kind of angry or sad and you put all of that in the song. And it kind of makes the song better because it's real feelings in it. And when you finish the song, you feel a lot better.